Well, if you must know, Mr. Dirty. Too much fishing, not enough catching. Mike Rowe, renowned for his gritty persona, gained fame as the amiable host of Discovery Channel's Dirty Jobs for eight seasons. His adventures alongside blue-collar workers showcased his willingness to get his hands dirty. Following this success, Rowe embarked on the daring CNN series, Somebody's Gotta Do It. Beyond his television persona, Rowe's life holds intriguing facets waiting to be discovered. From his early days to his off-screen endeavors, there's more to Mike Rowe than meets the eye. So, take a moment to explore the depths of his experiences and appreciate the multifaceted individual behind the camera. Childhood and Early Life Roe grew up in Baltimore County, Maryland, with his parents John and Peggy, both of whom were teachers. He often speaks fondly of his family, particularly his father and grandfather in commercials for Dirty Jobs, expressing that the show is a homage to their influence on him. His upbringing was marked by a strong sense of community and service, as evidenced by his involvement in the Boy Scouts, where he attained the rank of Eagle Scout in 1979 as a member of Troop 16 in Overly. During his time as an Eagle Scout, Rowe undertook a service project at the Maryland School for the Blind, where he read to students. This experience left a profound impact on him, shaping his interest in narration and writing. He credits his involvement in scouting and this project as pivotal moments that influenced his career path. Throughout his youth, Rowe was actively engaged in his local church, Kenwood Presbyterian Church in Nottingham, Maryland, where his parents remained active members. He was deeply involved in his community, finding fulfillment in both his faith and service activities. Academically, Rowe excelled in high school, particularly in theater and singing at Overly High School, where he graduated in 1980. His passion for performance arts blossomed during these formative years, laying the foundation for his future endeavors. After high school, he continued his education at Essex Community College, furthering his studies and exploring his interests. In 1985, Rowe earned a degree in communication studies from Towson University. His time at Towson University provided him with a comprehensive understanding of communication theory and practice, equipping him with the skills necessary for his future career. Throughout his academic journey, Rowe demonstrated a commitment to learning and personal development, preparing himself for the opportunities that lay ahead. Rowe's upbringing and educational experiences played a significant role in shaping his career trajectory acting career. He always had an interest in television, and for Mike Rowe to become a television actor, he needed something called a SAG card, a special card that proves he's a professional actor. But here's the tricky part. Mike lived in Maryland, and getting this card was like trying to solve a puzzle without all the pieces. You see, to get the card, he needed to do something called union work. But to get that union work, he needed, you guessed it, the SAG card first. It was like chasing your own tail. Mike explained this problem to a guy named Glenn Beck, calling it a classic catch-22, which means it's a problem where you need something to get something else, but you can't get the first thing without already having the second. Thankfully, there was a way out of this tricky situation. If he joined a special group called a union, like the American Guild of Musical Artists, he could use that to get into another group more easily. Problem solved. Mike had a plan now, and now he just needed to put his plan into action, which was the fun part. So Mike decided to focus on the opera union as his way in. He picked a short and simple song to perform for his audition. The song he chose was from a famous opera called La Boheme by Puccini. A month later, it was time for Mike's audition. As you might expect, things didn't go perfectly. After his performance, the person watching him asked a blunt question. You have no idea what you're doing, do you? Despite not being a pro, Mike got some good feedback. They said he had a nice voice instead of turning him away. They had another idea. They wanted to dress him up like a pirate and let him join anyway. And just like that, Pirate Mike was born. What's even more surprising is that Mike ended up really enjoying being a part of the opera scene. He stuck around for seven years, which is a long time for something he only planned to do temporarily. Looking back, maybe Mike could have taken an easier route, like acting in Hallmark movies, known for their feel-good stories. But sometimes the challenging path leads to unexpected adventures. He used to host trivia games on CD-ROMs. Mike Rowe's journey in the world of entertainment began with something quite simple, narrating and hosting trivia games on CD-ROMs. This might sound like ancient history now, but back then, 
it was a big deal for him. After toiling away at this, he finally made his breakthrough in television. But before he became the face of Dirty Jobs, he had some smaller gigs on local television stations. One of his gigs involved narrating a segment called Somebody's Gotta Do It. This segment turned out to be a hit among viewers, and it planted the seed for what would later become his famous show. When Dirty Jobs finally made its debut on television, Mike Rowe felt a surge of pride. However, it wasn't an instant success. It took years of hard work and dedication before the show gained popularity and propelled his career forward. In interviews, Rowe has been quite open about the struggles he faced before reaching this level of success. In one of his interviews, Mike Rowe talked about his prophetic vision regarding the skills gap in the United States. He noticed a troubling trend where schools were gradually moving away from teaching hands-on skills. This, according to Rowe, created a significant gap in the workforce. He believes this shift led to a decline in blue-collar jobs and an increase in the demand for white-collar jobs. Rowe's insights didn't just come out of thin air. He had been observing these trends for quite some time. He saw how the removal of shop classes from high schools had far-reaching consequences for the labor market. This, he argues, is the root cause of many issues we see today, such as the shortage of skilled workers. Dirty Jobs wasn't just a television show for Mike Rowe. It was a platform to shed light on the often overlooked contributions of essential workers. Even though the tasks he performed on the show weren't glamorous, Rowe took pride in showcasing the importance of these jobs. Little did he know that this show would catapult him into the spotlight and turn him into an expert on labor-related issues. Despite the show's eventual success, it wasn't an easy journey for Rowe. He had to work tirelessly to get people to pay attention to the struggles faced by essential workers. It took years before Dirty Jobs gained widespread recognition as a reality show. But once it did, it opened up a world of opportunities for Rowe, allowing him to delve deeper into labor-related topics. By 2008, Dirty Jobs had been on the air for five years. Its timing couldn't have been more perfect, as it coincided with a recession that put the spotlight on the skills gap in America. Suddenly, Rowe found himself in demand as a commentator, drawing from the experiences shared by the hardworking individuals featured on his show. Although Dirty Jobs eventually came to an end in 2012, its impact lived on. It paved the way for Rowe to establish the Micah Rowe Works Foundation, aimed at helping young people explore career paths beyond traditional college education. Dirty Job wasn't meant to run this long. 21 years ago, Dirty Jobs began, and it lasted for 169 episodes. It traveled to all 50 states of the United States. It's pretty surprising to learn that this show, which made Mike Rowe famous, wasn't meant to be a big thing at first. In fact, it started with just three one-hour specials. Mike Rowe became well-known because of it, but it wasn't easy at the start. Rowe first got noticed by the Discovery Channel with a tape showing one of his more daring segments from his old job on Evening Magazine in San Francisco. This segment was about artificial cow insemination, showing Rowe's willingness to do tough jobs. People loved those first specials. Lots of viewers watched them and liked them. This got Rowe thinking, maybe he could make more episodes like these. He asked Discovery Channel if they were interested and they said yes. And just like that, Dirty Jobs began. This marked the start of an exciting adventure into lesser-known jobs across America. Mike Rowe says on his website that the journey that followed was amazing, even though it was sometimes dirty. In each episode, Rowe and his team explored different jobs that many people don't know much about. They looked at jobs like cleaning sewers or taking care of exotic animals. These jobs are important, but not everyone knows about them. What made Dirty Jobs special was how real it was. Rowe didn't hide how hard or messy the jobs were. Instead, he embraced it and got fully involved in each job. Whether he was shoveling manure on a farm or cleaning out a dirty tank, Rowe brought humor and respect to every task. This made people all over the world admire him. Dirty Jobs wasn't just a popular show. It became a big part of the entertainment culture. People liked watching the unique jobs on the show, but they also liked Rowe's down-to-earth personality. He wasn't just a host, he was like a friend, showing viewers what it's like to work in tough jobs with humor and charm. As the series went on, Rowe became more than just a television guy. He became a champion for workers. Through his work on Dirty Jobs, he talked about the importance of learning trades and respecting all kinds of work. People listened to him and started talking about how important it is to appreciate all kinds of jobs. In a world where we often only see the glamorous side of things, Rowe reminded us that simple jobs are important too. 
Whether it was the satisfaction of finishing a job well or the friendship among co-workers, dirty jobs showed the beauty in everyday moments. Letter for New Eagle Scouts After Mike Rowe achieved the esteemed honor of Eagle Scout, he received a letter from President Gerald Ford congratulating him. This letter, written on fancy paper with the presidential stamp, featured Ford's name and a photocopied signature, giving it a formal touch. However, Rowe felt that despite its appearance, it lacked sincerity, as it seemed like a generic form letter. Later in life, as the host of his own show, Rowe decided to create his own form letter for new Eagle Scouts. He offered to send it to any Eagle Scout who requested one, signing and personalizing it, provided they sent him a self-addressed, stamped envelope. Rowe's approach differed from Ford's in several ways. Firstly, he openly acknowledged that his letter was a form letter, a transparency rarely seen, especially from presidents. Additionally, Rowe's letter featured five blanks where he would handwrite the recipient's name, adding a personal touch to each correspondence. By creating his own form letter, Rowe aimed to offer new Eagle Scouts a more genuine and personalized congratulatory message than what he had received from President Ford. Furthermore, Rowe's approach highlights the importance of authenticity in communication. While form letters serve a practical purpose in reaching a wide audience, they often lack the personal touch that can make a message truly impactful. A prominent narrator. Even if you've never seen the show Dirty Jobs, you've probably heard the voice of Mike Rowe somewhere. He's been a prominent narrator since 1984, using his smooth voice for TV programs, ads, and even audio versions of religious texts. Rowe once addressed whether he disagrees with the content he narrates, likening it to a plumber fixing a clogged toilet. He simply does the job without questioning or forming opinions. In his early days, Rowe narrated the infamously bad Wonder Boner commercial, where a fisherman teases viewers with, just wait until you see what I've got. But as Rowe gained fame, he became more selective with his projects, avoiding similar cheesy ads. His rise to fame also led him to increase his fees for narration work, though he humorously admits that he's still open to being bought, just not as often as before. Being famous raised questions about his credibility, prompting him to be more careful about associating his voice with certain products. Rowe's analogy of narrating to plumbing highlights his approach to his work. He sees it as a job to be completed to the best of his ability, without getting bogged down in personal opinions or moral judgments. $35 million fortune. Mike Rowe is a wealthy man with an estimated fortune of $35 million. Despite his riches, he chooses to live in a modest apartment in San Francisco, where he has resided for 14 years. Rowe's decision to remain in his apartment was recently disclosed when a fan on Facebook asked him if he lived in a mansion. Rowe was quick to admit that he does not, noting that he once house-sat in one but preferred his current living situation. He finds contentment in his apartment, particularly enjoying the view of Treasure Island and Alcatraz. Despite having enough money to afford multiple mansions, Rowe finds comfort and satisfaction in his modest dwelling. He values the simplicity and familiarity of his apartment lifestyle over the extravagance of a mansion. Living in a mansion may seem appealing to many, but for Rowe it holds little allure. He appreciates the comfort and coziness of his apartment, where he has made a home for himself over the years. Some may question Rowe's decision to forego the luxury of a mansion in favor of his modest apartment. However, he remains steadfast in his choice, finding fulfillment and happiness in his current living arrangement. In a world where wealth and status often dictate one's choices, Rowe's decision to prioritize comfort and familiarity over extravagance is refreshing. He serves as a reminder that true happiness lies in being true to oneself and finding joy in the simple things in life. Sesame Street Mike Rowe knows exactly how to find Sesame Street. He visited the iconic children's show back in 2010 for a segment of Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. He had a late night out in Manhattan the night before, but he made it to the set on time. During his appearance, he met Oscar the Grouch, who, according to Rowe, is a rather messy character. Rowe, being no stranger to dirt himself, made for an entertaining and somewhat grimy television segment. Rowe's encounter with Oscar wasn't just memorable for the messiness. He was even invited into Oscar's trash can through a less conventional entrance. Despite being on a children's show, Rowe couldn't resist cracking a sarcastic joke, which might have been a bit too crude for the usual public broadcasting service audience. Yes, it was a joke about a back door, and surprisingly, it managed to slip past the public broadcasting service censors. But for the adults watching with their kids, it might have been a welcome change from the usual innocent content. 
While reflecting on the incident later, Roe admitted that the joke was rather immature, but he couldn't deny that it added an amusing twist to the experience. He clarified on his website that he wasn't exactly proud of the joke, but it happened nonetheless. Despite the unconventional humor, Roe's stint on Sesame Street served as a reminder that it's okay to let loose and have fun, even in unexpected places. His willingness to play along with the antics of Oscar the Grout showed his versatility as a performer and his ability to connect with audiences of all ages. So, while he may not need directions to Sesame Street, Mike Rowe certainly knows how to make an impression once he gets there. Somebody's gotta do it. When Mike Rowe moved to CNN to host Somebody's Gotta Do It, he explained why his previous show, Dirty Jobs, ended. Firstly, he didn't want it to grow bigger and feature celebrities like Gwyneth Paltrow or John Stamos. He preferred to keep the show focused on ordinary people doing challenging jobs. Secondly, Rowe noticed a shift in the reality TV landscape. Shows were moving towards scripted formats, unlike his unscripted one-take style. He pointed out examples like Duck Dynasty and Here Comes Honey Boo Boo, which had writer's rooms, unlike his show. Even in his Reddit Ask Me Anything session in 2014, Roe hinted at the lack of authenticity in some reality shows. He mentioned his work on Ghost Hunters and suggested that the paranormal experiences depicted might not be entirely genuine, implying that there was a financial incentive behind such shows. Hence, Mike Rowe ended Dirty Jobs to maintain its authenticity and avoid the trend of scripted reality television, preferring to focus on showcasing real people in real jobs. His voice was featured in a Walmart ad. Over the years, Mike Rowe unintentionally became a representative for overworked and underpaid Americans. In 2014, his voice was featured in a Walmart ad, a company often criticized for its treatment of employees. This caused surprise and controversy. Rowe's association with the Walmart ad led to unexpected consequences, including death threats as reported by Business Insider. In response, Roe made light of the situation on Facebook, joking about the threats and quipping about the enjoyment of press tours. Roe's involvement with Walmart's ad coincided with the release of his book, Profoundly Disconnected, a true confession from Mike Rowe, as CBS News reported. This gave him a platform to explore the notion that any publicity is beneficial. He demonstrated this by engaging in discussions on social media, even dismissing criticism of Walmart with a casual attitude. The juxtaposition of Rowe's persona as a champion for workers' rights with his involvement in a Walmart ad highlighted the complexity of his public image. The controversy surrounding the ad showcased the tensions between his personal brand and the companies he associates with. Despite the negative attention, Rowe seemed undeterred using the controversy to generate interest in his book and engage with his audience. His nonchalant response to criticism further emphasized his willingness to navigate controversy for the sake of publicity. The backlash against Rowe's involvement in the Walmart ad revealed broader societal concerns about the treatment of workers by large corporations. It served as a reminder of the power dynamics at play in the relationship between celebrities, corporations, and the general public. Work out in prisons. Long before Spartan races and CrossFit workouts made the challenging exercise called the burpee popular, it was mainly known as a workout in prisons. Inmates used this exercise to build strength without needing weight. A burpee combines elements of push-ups, squats, and lunges with an explosive jump at the end of each repetition. You can do burpees anywhere since they require no equipment and only a small space. Because Mike Rowe has spent a lot of time traveling for the past 20 years, he started doing burpees as a workout. He found that they work just as well in a typical hotel room as they do in a prison cell. He explained in a fan question and answer how he does them, showing how they are done and discussing their positive impact on his fitness. People once thought he was dead. One day, Mike Rowe woke up to a bizarre situation. People online thought he was dead. This strange incident started with a noisy drone outside his window. Mike, still in his birthday suit meaning he was completely was abruptly awakened by the drone's buzzing. Confused and annoyed, he grabbed his shotgun and stormed outside to confront the intrusive device. As he aimed his shotgun at the drone, he realized the consequences of his actions. He imagined the headlines that would follow if he shot it down. Dirty jobs guy totally loses it, gets naked and shoots drone from San Francisco skies. The thought of his mom seeing such a spectacle terrified him. So instead of pulling the trigger, he opted to capture the moment with his cell phone camera. The incident, which led to a death hoax, 
was triggered by the noise of Roe loading his shotgun. The noise leads to a misunderstanding. Mike, still in disbelief at the absurdity of the situation, couldn't help but find the humor in it. Despite the chaos, his reaction to the drone was simply to take a picture as it flew away. Rose's experience serves as a reminder of the unpredictability of life in the digital age. One moment you could be peacefully asleep, and the next, you're unwittingly at the center of an online rumor. Most importantly, it emphasizes the importance of privacy and respect for boundaries in an increasingly interconnected world. We hope you enjoyed this video. See you in the next Iwana R.